This is Don Cusick with The Music Biz, and today my guest is Charles Wolf. Charles is an author, having written a number of books, among them Tennessee Strings. Can we see this? That's a glare. Tennessee Strings, uh, Kentucky Country, Truth is Stranger Than Publicity, which is uh, uh, an autobiography of the Delmore Brothers, The Grand Old Opry, which was published in England. I don't think it's been published here, has it? Yeah. And Everybody's Grandpa, which is the uh, autobiography slash biography of Grandpa Jones. Um, Charles, let me let me begin by just just asking you your background. Where did, you're from Missouri? Mm -hmm. Grew up there. Then you went into the army. Right, well, sort of. Um, I started out. I was born in Sedalia, Missouri, which is the ragtime capital of Missouri, where Scott Joplin wrote the Maple Leaf Rag, and where most of the great ragtime started out. And my folks, however, were from the Ozarks, they were, which is further south, it's, it's sort of a, a miniature Appalachia. And they had moved up and were living in, in Sedalia, which is right in the center of the state, not too far from the Missouri River. And so I was born in Sedalia and grew up there and uh, listened to ragtime and uh, jazz, and then later on moved back down to the Ozarks with my parents. And of course, most of my folks who still live there were playing fiddle music and old-time country music. So. I really grew up there and uh, and got most of my interest in music started there. Hmm. Then you went to Kansas? Yeah, I got a uh, uh, what they call a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship for uh, graduate study after I finished my undergraduate work. Where'd you go undergraduate? I got undergraduate at, at Southwest Missouri University, which is in Springfield. And at the time, uh, I wasn't really even interested much in going to school. It was just something to do. I was playing in a, uh, a band at the time, and I fully expected to make my career as a tenor saxophone player. And I was playing in a, a rock and roll band at nights and I sort of, out of boredom and curiosity, signed up for some courses at the university. And so I finally finished there and got a, a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship and I used it to go to the University of Kansas uh, where I got involved in folklore and uh, English and history. Now, your undergraduate degree was history. I was a double major of history and English. Okay, graduate you were in English. Right. How did you get into folklore? Well, uh, like in many universities, the University of Kansas, uh, the, the uh, person who was in teaching folklore up there was in the English department. A lot of the bigger universities back in those days had what folklore they taught located in the English department. A lot of universities still do today, including uh, MTSU. But uh, fortunately, I got to Kansas at a time that two or three of the countries uh, who later on became the country's most successful folklorists were there. I uh, was there when uh, Alan Dundas was there and Bob Georges was there and Robert Smith. And all of these people later went on to become fairly well-known folklorists. And I took uh, a couple of their courses out of curiosity and kind of got hooked on folklore. And so I wound up doing quite a bit of my uh, graduate work in folklore, although my degree actually wound up being in English. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you get to Middle Tennessee State? Well, when I graduated with my Ph.D. in 1970, I uh, interviewed at a couple of places and uh, located down here mainly because I, um, I didn't think of it as in terms of being close to Nashville. At that particular time, I wasn't necessarily interested in country music. Uh, I simply liked the people down here and especially the department chairman, Dr. Peck, and decided that after I had interviewed down here, I really wanted to work here and work for him. Mm -hmm. He was... Um, uh, as most people who are around MTSU any time know, a very remarkable man. And one of the things he did was to encourage me to go ahead and do research that might be a little bit unorthodox by traditional English department standards. He had no trouble handling the fact that I was interested in music or discography or some of these other areas. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of music were you interested in at the time? When I came down here, I was, uh, I was very much interested in jazz and blues, especially blues. I had actually started a dissertation on, on uh, blues. Uh, especially what they call country blues, folk blues, mm -hmm. uh, blues from the 20s and 30s, people like Robert Johnson. Uh, and I was wanting to do a dissertation there, but my, my committee people wouldn't approve of it. It was so unorthodox at the time that they felt like it uh, was something that they simply could not approve, so I wasn't able to do it. But when I came down here, um, I, I had been interested and listened to country music and grew up, grown up with it, mm -hmm. but I had never really thought about seriously researching it until after I came down here. Uh, when I came down here, the first, I think the first article I had published actually was an article on blues. Hmm. It was a survey of blues research that was published in a journal called Pop Music and Society. That was published up at Bowling Green. Uncle Dave Macon, 
That was that your first real interest here, or first well, book that came out of here? Yeah. What happened was after I had been down here, I got interested in Uncle Dave Macon, obviously, since he was the local, the local mm -hmm. hero, the, lo the local musician, and I began to run into stories about him, and began to kind of dig around in his background. And about 1972, the uh, editors at the University of Illinois Press uh, contacted me and wanted to know if I would write an essay on Uncle Dave Macon for a book they were putting together called Stars of Country Music. And so this was the first chance I'd had to really do a part of a book. And so I dug in and went around. And at that time, there were still quite a few people around who performed with Uncle Dave and knew quite a bit mm -hmm. about him. So I went ahead and did that essay. And that sort of got me in the position of being an expert on Uncle Dave Macon, whether I liked it or not. <laughs> but it did lead to an interest in, in you know, the whole milieu that Uncle Dave was a part of, the 1920s, the early phonograph recording, and the early Grand Old Opry. How do you do research on somebody like that? Well, it's tricky because Uncle Dave had been dead for 30 years. Uh, I, I started doing my research, first of all, by, of course, talking to people, which is what, up until then, almost everybody else had, had done. The, the notion of doing research in country music was basically oral history. Mm -hmm. You went and you found people and you took down what they said, and that was the history. Uh, I, uh, with my training as a historian, I was naturally a little bit skeptical of that because I know people's memories are fallible. And so I began to try to, uh, to buttress the stuff I was gaining through oral interviews with, uh, with printed sources. And I found that my, my first good source were the, uh, the microfilm uh, back issues of the local newspapers. Uh, they contained a wealth of information uh, that in many cases had accurate uh, dates and places mm -hmm. and, and information of that sort. And so I began to dig that up. I began to look for other printed sources in uh, places like the Nashville Room, uh, in the Nashville Public Library. I began to find uh, earlier printed sources. I began to find uh, ledgers and records from uh, WSM. I found a huge collection of materials that an old WSM engineer had given to Vanderbilt Special Collection Library, including logs that the radio station had kept. And finally, uh, discographies. Uh, working out the details of when records were recorded. And so anyway, I would take all of this printed information and I would juxtapose it with what people remembered and try to arrive at some kind of, of truth from that. And so uh, when I got my first book out on the Grand Old Opry, it was the first time this had really been done mm -hmm. with the Opry. A lot of people had done uh, books and histories of the Opry, but it basically had been focused pretty much on just going out and seeing what so-and-so remembered. Uh, this mine was the first time, I think, where somebody had actually tried to piece together the history from other sources as well. And of course, when you do that, you not only have the advantage of having exact dates and exact places, but you also, in some cases, learn about stuff that nobody happened to remember. And so there were certainly entire uh, you know, groups of artists that had just all died off and nobody happened to be around anymore. Mm -hmm. And I was able to at least find out something about them. Did, did they cooperate? Did the people, did the oh, people yes. at the Opry cooperate? Uh, well, the people at the Grand Old Opry did in, as much as they could. By the time I was starting to, uh, to interview people, most of the people I talked to were, were retired mm -hmm. from the Opry. So I didn't really need to get uh, you know, backstage at the Opry very much, although uh, people like Jerry Strobel were very helpful in helping mm -hmm. me out as much as they could. Uh, but most of the people I went to were people who no longer were active musically. And in many cases, had even, they felt like they had even been kind of forgotten by modern music. And they were just delighted to have somebody to talk to to tell their version of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my, the, probably the person who helped me more than anybody else with my first book, which was one on the Grand Old Opry, uh, was Alcyon Bate Beasley. And she was the daughter of Dr. Humphrey Bate, who was the first person to play on the Grand Old Opry, really, mm -hmm. in, in spite of the legend about Uncle Jimmy Thompson. It was Dr. Humphrey Bate. And she, uh, at the time, was, was for all practical purposes retired and uh, had been very concerned about her father's place in history. And so she was delighted to help me and, and really spent an awful lot of time with me working through her, her father's notes and scrapbooks and letters. And here again, that's the sort of documentation I was looking for. She was mm -hmm. a, a real archivist herself, and she saved everything. And so I had a delightful time rummaging through the, the letters and the uh, copies of of music and, and, and is, information. Is that what you always look for? So somebody who's got that whole batch of letters or, or, or journals nice. or diaries mm -hmm. or this kind of thing? 
Yeah, you'll be surprised at the number of people who have kept records and information. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times people think that the big stars have the, the big scrapbooks and things, but a lot of the biggest and most important stars, not only in country music, I think, but in jazz and blues and all kinds of, of pop music, some of them don't necessarily care about the past. They don't keep scrapbooks, they don't keep uh, documents, uh, and in fact they don't even remember things very well because they've had so much of it. But uh, quite often it's the side men, the people who are on the periphery of the, of the activity who sometimes keep the big scrapbooks mm -hmm. and the uh, piles of information and then who in some cases have the best memories. So when I'm looking to find somebody uh, who is, is really um, or trying to find some particular area to research, uh, sometimes it's, it's useful to find somebody who may not have even been a major figure uh, or to find the person who is the good talker, the good raconteur. Uh, a person who is on the, the periphery of something, if that person has a good vivid memory for details and is a good storyteller, that person is probably more important really than talking to a major figure. Hmm. So okay. this is what I like to hunt up if I can. Let's, let's talk about building reputation of a researcher. You began by publishing in academic journals. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're, they're basically small journals that not many people read them. Why are they important? Well, they're important because you can publish in there the kind of details and the kind of, uh, of, of really hard core data that the general publication wouldn't be able to publish. Uh, some of these journals don't circulate more than five or six hundred copies, but the people that read them are other scholars and other researchers, and you can put in there an awful lot of hard factual information. You can also, uh, this, this is true of other areas, not so much of country music, although it's becoming so, you can also in those journals uh, you know, come up with theoretical constructions to, to interpret a particular batch of data. And sometimes these interpretations are fairly complicated and again are not really all that suitable mm -hmm. for a popular journal or a popular magazine. But you have to have the, uh, the data there. You have to have it out and then later on you can think about it, you can digest it and uh, possibly then you can popularize it and make it uh, accessible to a more general audience. Where, where are some of the places that, that, that you published to start with, some of the first articles coming out? Uh, well, the first articles I published were in uh, a magazine that was published in England called Old Time Music and it, it circulated widely over here. It was uh, ironically uh, both in blues and jazz and early country music scholarship people in England took it a lot more seriously than we did over here. Uh, in the 30s and 40s, people were interested in jazz and blues over in England. They were digging around and really finding it out. American scholars didn't seem to care. And the same thing has been true with early country music. The, the British, for some reason, perhaps they're distanced from it. Maybe they can romanticize it more. But they's, oh, they've always taken it more seriously. So there was a magazine called Old Time Music that started up uh, about 1972. And I began corresponding with the editor and publishing articles in there, and he encouraged me and, uh, and actually gave me some suggestions. Uh, that actually was, um, I suspect, probably circulated more over here in the United States than it did in England, but he happened to be in England, and, and so he worked on it. Then there was a, a magazine called the JMF Quarterly, which uh, had started actually a couple of years before uh, Old Time Music, which was published uh, at UCLA. Uh, it was the, the best and still is probably the best academic journal on country music. Uh, the name JEMF Quarterly comes from a man named John Edwards. It stands for the John Edwards Memorial Foundation Quarterly. And John Edwards was actually an Australian scholar of country music who in the 40s and 50s, uh, living you know, thousands of miles from the, uh, the center of country music, succeeded in compiling an amazing amount of information about the history of country music. He would write to people, uh, uh, old time musicians uh, who had been retired for 20 or 30 years and asked them questions. He would compile discographies based on what few records he could get hold of in Australia. And he was, um, uh, again, one of those uh, people who took American music seri more seriously than Americans did. And so in any event, he, was, uh, he, was, he died tragically uh, at an early age, and in his will, he left his considerable collection to a, a, not a specific university, but a major American university, preferably located in the South. And the executors of his will at that time searched through the South and tried to find a university to take this collection. 
and they approached places like Vanderbilt and the University of Tennessee, and at that time nobody was the slightest bit interested in it. So they finally placed it at UCLA. And this collection, a record collection and a collection of songbooks and printed material, became the, uh, the basis for the, the first really substantial country music archive, which was located at UCLA. So the JEMF Quarterly was basically then a, a journal that was generated as a result of that establishment of the archive out there. And I published a number of, of things in it as well. Uh, then there was an, um, a journal called Popular Music and Society that, that Ron Denisoff published. Uh, the folklore journals would quite often publish articles on country music. Uh, in 1968, I believe, the uh, Journal of American Folklore devoted an entire issue to early country music, which was a first, an important first. Uh, later on, people, uh, journals like Western Folklore, Southern Folklore Quarterly, uh, Kentucky Folklore Record, and a number of other journals began to accept articles on, on early country music or what, what people then called old time music. And finally, uh, the uh, Country Music Foundation in Nashville got established and about 1973 or 74 began to publish a, uh, a journal of country music, which is still, of course, being published mm -hmm. today. And that was yet another outlet for this sort of thing. The JEMF uh, material, is that still at UCLA? No, the material itself is now at the University of North Carolina. Uh, when the, uh, they went through a trying period about four or five years ago, and as a result, the collection itself was sold to uh, the University of North Carolina, where it is still intact and is, is available for research. Uh, the quarterly itself, of course, has moved here to MTSU as of 1986 and is now published here through the Center of Popular Music. Your first book uh, was the Opry book. Well, that right, was Opry. my first music book. I'd actually done a book on science fiction before then. Oh, really? What was that? It was a book called Planets and Dimensions, <laughs> and I did it in 1971. It was a, um, actually, it was a book of, uh, of, of sort of critical essays on fantasy and science fiction. Mm -hmm. And it was done uh, as a result of an interest I had uh, in a, a writer named Clark Ashton Smith, who was a con com uh, companion of H.P. Lovecraft's and was interested very much in in, in fantasy and science fiction. Hmm. So that was actually the first one I did. It's, it's very rare now. Does this make you schizophrenic that you do science fiction and music? No, it's actually, um, I think there's, there's, there's probably more relationship than some people think. Uh, in one sense, both of them are areas that are fairly, were fairly wide open. They aren't now so much, but at the time I started digging around, nobody was taking either one of them seriously. Uh, nowadays, of course, science fiction and fantasy is a recognized growth industry in, in academia, and everybody's writing books about, about these people. Uh, and that hasn't necessarily happened quite that way with country music, but in any case, both of them were, were really interesting, and both of them at the time were, were really unexplored areas. Hmm. Let me ask you about the Grand Ole Opry, the early years, 1925 to, to 35. How did this book come about? It was originally supposed to be a pamphlet. Um, the editor of Old Time Music had written me and said the um, 50th anniversary of the Opry was coming up in 1975. And he thought it would be appropriate to, uh, to maybe do a pamphlet on how the Opry had gotten started. And at that time, there was still a lot of, of really bad misinformation around about the history of the Opry, including stuff the Opry itself had put out. And so I thought, well, rather than focus on the later years and the more glamorous years, I, it would be interesting to go ahead and, and do some kind of a history of the early years while the people who can tell the history are still around. And so uh, I began to write on what I thought would be about a 15 or 20 page pamphlet. And one person led me to another person, and another person led me to another person. And I just kept writing. And eventually it came into a, to be a full length book. And uh, it. Uh, has, even though it, it's technically out of print and it's been out of print for quite a while, and a lot of people tend to still talk about it and refer to it, and I'm currently working on a revision of it that's going to be published next year by the University of Kentucky, hmm. which will make corrections. I have some errors in there that badly need correcting, and I want to take advantage of some new research that has come along since I finished that. Okay, what was your next book after, after the Opry? Uh, the next book was Tennessee Strings. Uh, which was uh, a fairly slim book. Mm -hmm. It was part of a series the University of Tennessee Press was doing called the Three Star Series. And these were designed as a series of reasonably inexpensive paperbacks that the Tennessee Historical Commission had, had subsidized. And the idea was to make available to a general public uh, 
and especially to college students and high school students, books about important facets of Tennessee history. And so the editor at the University of Tennessee Press was a man named Louis Eigelhart, and he approached me and uh, had read my Uncle Dave Macon things and knew about the Grand Old Opry, and so he said, why don't you write a nice overview just of country music in Tennessee? And this gave me a chance to get into print uh, some of the material from the Opry book. One of the chapters mm -hmm. in there deals with the history of the Opry. But it also gave me a chance to put into print a lot of miscellaneous research I had been doing at various points around the state involving music. Uh, one of the points I wanted to make in the book was that while Nashville was certainly a music center today and, and has been for 25 or 30 years, uh, in the 20s and 30s it wasn't really any more important than uh, centers to the east, uh, especially Knoxville and the Bristol Johnson City area. And in fact, most of the important recordings made in Tennessee in the 1920s were made in Bristol and Johnson City and Knoxville. Uh, Nashville was virtually unimportant as a recording center during this first golden age of country music. And the, uh, the great recordings that came out of, of uh, Tennessee were all done at the east. And so I, in the book, tried to bring this out and I, I gave some history of, of some of the uh, people who were active over there and who helped make the recordings and the s people who were behind the scenes and sort of gave East Tennessee some credit in the development of the whole, th whole scene. And I think that's one of the reasons why the book was well received because a lot of people in East Tennessee were, were glad to see somebody actually giving them some credit because for years and years they've lived in the shadow of Nashville and, and my thesis in the book basically was that Nashville wasn't, was, wasn't really very important at all until after World War II. Well, Tennessee's rather diverse. You've got rock and roll in, in Memphis. Mm -hmm. You've got gospel coming out of Lawrenceburg and southern Tennessee, if mm -hmm. there is a southern Tennessee. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then, and then that folk country out of, out of Knoxville. Well, you've got that, and then you've got, of course, the Upper East Tennessee area in Johnson mm -hmm. City, which is a big bluegrass center. Uh, Knoxville is actually kind of a weird area. It's, 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 um, in some ways, it's more sophisticated than Nashville in its history of music because over there in the 1930s on the radio stations, uh, WNOX and some of those other stations, uh, they would have bands that would uh, sort of be like Western swing bands. Uh, they would have a band, well, a band that Chet Atkins played in, for example. Uh, it was led by a trumpet player. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, would, they would mix pop and country music and uh, ethnic music of various sorts. And uh, there was a good, strong interplay between black and white music over there. Uh, the, uh, a number of, of black string bands uh, played in the Knoxville area. So in some ways, Knoxville was really more of a melting pot than any place, uh, even and for a while at least, I think, even more than Memphis. Hmm. Now, didn't you collect uh, some songs over there? Didn't you, didn't you go out and collect people and songs? Oh, yeah, I did that a lot. Uh, explain, explain what that is. I mean, how do you collect songs and, and, and do this folklore type research? Well, uh, most of my song collecting came as a result of my trying to find out about old musicians. And what would happen generally is that, at first at least, I would, uh, I would go track down older musicians and then I would find out that either they still performed or maybe they knew somebody in the area that performed. And I began to, to unearth a nice number of good traditional musicians as I did my, my digging around. And so quite often uh, I would stumble into it just by that. Let me give you an example. I, uh, one of the groups that recorded in Knoxville, and, and, and I knew this by my discographies I had worked up of, of Knoxville music, was a group called the Perry County Music Makers. And I had assumed all along, nobody knew who these people were, nobody in Knoxville remembered them or anything. And I assumed they were probably from Perry County, Kentucky, and had tried to find them up there and couldn't. And one day down here, uh, one of my students walked into my office. And I always tell my students I'm interested in music, and especially old time music. And I always say, if you have a grandfather or an uncle or an aunt that plays music or sings ballads, let me know. So one, one day, a student walked into my office and said, uh, you know, my uh, aunt and uncle used to make records a long time ago, and they recorded over in Knoxville one time. And, so uh, I immediately got out my list of people who had recorded in Knoxville and started running down them, and it turned out they were, in fact, the Perry County Music Makers, and they came from Perry County, Tennessee. So that, that same weekend, I went down, I'd called them on the phone and went down and, and uh, talked to them and started interviewing them, and to my amazement, they still played. They were still both playing and both, both active. And they, their music was really unique. It, uh, the woman who, who was the leader of the band played a zither, uh, not, not a little bitty thing like an auto harp, but one the size of, of this table, a huge mahogany zither that uh, was just absolutely beautiful and unique. Nobody else had ever played one like it. Mm 
And her music was so lovely and so beautiful, I felt like we really needed to record her. And so at the time, I, I had a good friend up at Austin P. who um, he and I have both been fooling around with recording people. So he, um, he brought down his little Sony tape recorder and we set up in their front room and recorded them. And the tapes were so good that we later on decided to issue them as an album and, and started a series of, of records by doing this, a series of, of basically Tennessee traditional music recordings that we issued on LP and we, used the, we had the label, length the label was called Davis Unlimited. And we wound up issuing about 35 or 36 albums before it got mm -hmm. over with and to our great pleasure, not only were the records reasonably successful, none of them were best sellers, but they sold enough that we could go back and make another record. And the, uh, uh, they were well received and well reviewed. And many of the people that we found uh, later on found their way to folk festivals. Um, the Perry County Music Makers went to the Smithsonian Institution one summer and got a chance to perform up there. So uh, most of the musicians uh, that you find usually you find as a result of doing research on the music. And then, of course, once you find the musicians, you start collecting songs. How about the next, uh, uh, the next book that you did? I guess that would be Kentucky? the... No, this would be the Delmore Brothers book oh, the, here. That, now, how did you... How did you well, this is not really a... Of that, yeah. It's not really a book I wrote. It's mm -hmm. a book I found. Um, I had, at the time, I uh, believe there was a, a series of, of reissues that RCA Victor was doing called the Bluebird series. And they were, had commissioned me to do liner notes for a reissue of the Delmore Brothers. And so in order to really do decent notes, since both Delmore brothers had died some time ago, I finally tracked down a, uh, a son of one of the Delmores who was living over here at Fairview. And I explained what I wanted to do. And he said, well, sure, come on over. We'll talk. So we hit it off pretty well. It turned out that he was an interesting uh, guy who liked to read a lot. And he himself was a songwriter. And in fact, as a footnote, his name was Lionel Delmore. And of course, at that time, I didn't know it. He had written some songs and published it. But of course, nowadays, he's known, known as the uh, com composer of Swingin', among others. Swingin'. Swingin'. <laughs> so anyway, he, uh, he was uh, the son of, of uh, Alton Delmore, who was the senior member of the Delmore Brothers. And as we continued to talk, and as he continued to, to see I was really interested in their life, uh, he mentioned that his father was a frustrated writer. And that's always interested me, because I'm, a lot of country song performers are in fact frustrated writers. It's always been sort of fascinating. Ernest Tubb, Jim Anglin, a number of these mm -hmm. people have tried to write stories or novels. Uh, so in any event, uh, he began digging around in his files and found a couple of short stories that his father had written, which were kind of interesting. And we kept on digging. And in the back of one of the filing cabinets, there was this great big thick package of typed pages tied up. And I pulled it out and I said, what's this? And he said, oh, that's my father's autobiography that he started and uh, died before he got a chance to finish it. And so he let me borrow it that night. And I took it home. And I literally sat up all night reading it because it was the most fascinating thing I'd ever seen. Because here was a first person account of the music business from 1928 to the present by a person who was right there in the middle of all of it. And nobody had ever read any of that stuff before. None of, none of this stuff had ever been out. So I took, uh, I took the manuscript the next day down to Doug Green who was then working at the Country Music Foundation. He, that was before he became a member of Writers in the Sky. And Doug was the oral historian down there, and he was a Delmore Brothers fan. And so he, he, he agreed this was good enough to be published. And uh, he, he and I really kind of forced it through the Country Music Foundation press. It, it's probably the worst seller they've ever produced. <laughs> but it's great in the sense that it's uh, you know, really a good, solid piece of information. It tells, you, it tells us more about what the music business was like in the 20s and 30s than anything. I mean, this, this guy was, was a hard, scrabbling musician. And he talks about contracts, and he talks about royalties, and he talks about working the, uh, the sticks and all that kind of stuff. And it's okay. just all there. No, nobody's uh, been able to come up with anything as good as this to tell us what it was really like. Okay. Charles, I'm gonna, we're going to end this section right now, uh, part one with, with, with Charles. Uh, this is Don Cusick with the Music Biz. Mm -hmm.
this is Don Cusick with the Music Biz, and this is part two of the interview with Charles Wolf. Uh, Charles, we were, uh, you had talked about records that you had made and, and with the label and whatnot, and I know with the Tennessee Folklore Society you put out, or they put out folk records. Mm -hmm. um, how do they sell? Who buys them? Well, okay. Uh when we started putting out records on our own, it was about, you know, the 70s. And the market then was probably a lot better than it is now. But we found that there were basically two types of people buying the records we put out. And, and let me preface this by saying when we put out folk music records, that means different things to different people. Uh, what we were putting out primarily was, was fiddlers, uh, string band music, uh, maybe old time country singing as much as anything else. And we found that, that there was, even though these people that we recorded didn't tour or perform professionally, there was a circuit that a lot of them got on. It was the, the fiddling contest circuit, the old time banjo contest circuit. And some of these people would make, uh, in the summer, would make one of these festivals virtually every week. So we had an outlet at these festivals. We would set up tables at these festivals back in those days and just sell lots of these records, especially at fiddling contests. If the person that happened to win the contest was a fiddler that we had recorded, then that was good for a couple of boxes of records because people would come over there and buy his records. Uh, then in addition to that audience, which I would call you know, the contest or festival audience, uh, there was a mail order audience. And the mail order audience included a lot of uh, uh, academics, uh, people who you know, were studying folk music, and they included a lot of people uh, from different parts of the country who liked southern music of various sorts and couldn't get it. Uh, so we had, you know, we had people in Maine and North Dakota and California and people of that sort who felt like, you know, they could get the real McCoy by writing to this little record company in Tennessee and uh, we would send them out stuff. So we had, we had two fairly interesting audiences. Um, and uh, as far as I know, we, we never actually got into a record store, although occasionally someplace like Ernest Tubbs Record Store in Nashville would pick up some. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, we just didn't fool with it. And we didn't fool very much with wholesalers, although again later on, we began to uh, be picked up by four or five big wholesalers who would order records wholesale. Uh, but 85% or 90% of our music uh, record sales back in the 70s was pretty much done directly to individuals at festivals or by mail. We had an awful lot of mail order business. Same audiences today? Generally speaking, yeah. Although I think today uh, it's probably been expanded to include a third group, which um, uh, I think would include people who uh, are in the country themselves and like old time music. People who don't go to festivals but you know, who are willing to, to write uh, down an order. Uh, we sell an awful lot of records today through outfits like County Sales over in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And his mailing list includes, it includes people who go to fiddling contests, it includes academics and people who buy their records more or less to study sort of. But it also includes a lot of just interest, you know, rural people from all over the country who like this sort of music. And before, I don't think we had that audience. Now they do, uh, because they, they're on the mailing list, they're plugged in. Uh, some of the record companies today that are selling this kind of music are advertising in place like uh, Capper's Farmer's Magazine. And uh, I've uh, even toyed with the idea myself of advertising in, in some of the feed journals, because this is a, another audience that loves this sort of music and doesn't mind ordering it by mail. Mm -hmm. Uh, to get it. Uh, the thing is that in most cases today, we're, we're still not really getting into the record stores. And people who want this kind of music have to be willing to go that extra mile to order it by mail or to go to the trouble of trying to get it. And fortunately, many people are, but, but not a huge, you know, not a huge well, what's, number. What, what are the kind of numbers here? What's a successful album? Well, back in the 70s when we were working, a successful album was a thousand sales mm -hmm. that would that's that was the break even point was lower than that the break even point at one point for us was about 350 records if we sold 350 records we were okay but if we had you know a thousand records was a nice a nice number and uh, I think the most we ever sold of any record was about 5,000 copies and that was considered a really successful album and I think today even uh, some of the records I have done for rounder for example uh, the initial pressing will be 1,800 or 2,000 and that'll probably do them for, uh, they'll eventually sell those, but it'll mm -hmm. take them four or five years to do it. So, you know, by, by, by major commercial music standards, this is, this is really a sort of a cottage industry. Uh, but it serves an important function. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as a result, you know, people continue to buy them and we continue to do them. Now, the audience wants authentic music, right? Yeah. They, they want the real fiddle player from 
back in the mountains or whatever. That's important. Isn't packaging important too? The liner notes? The liner notes are important. The liner notes are important. The cover and the design isn't very important because mm -hmm. most of it's sold by mail. Mm -hmm. But they do want good liner notes. Uh, and to the point that many of these records not only have liner notes on the back, but they have an insert uh, in the record of a little booklet mm -hmm. with liner notes. Some of the things that our Folklore Society puts out, for example, will have a booklet that is maybe 50 pages thick of notes about the songs and the musicians. And people expect that. People or, or, or libraries? You talking about no, people? No, people. Talking about people, because I, I know this because occasionally, in our folklore society record business, we will forget to put notes in a record, and we hear from people mm -hmm. about it routinely. Hey, I didn't get my notes. Send them right now. And they really want those notes. They want to read about these people, mm -hmm. and of course, they want to see the lyrics of the songs. We always print the lyrics of the songs as well. And I know that uh, I, last year I served on the uh, the panel at the Library of Congress uh, that selects the best folk music recordings of the year, and they put them on a recommended list that they send to all the libraries. And I was very interested last year to serve on it for the first time, and one of the things I noticed that counts just about as much as anything in their evaluation is the annotation. Uh, there were a number of records that, w that were submitted that were really interesting records. They were well produced, they had pretty pictures on the cover, they sounded good, but they didn't have anything on the back. And they were just tossed aside. Mm -hmm. summarily. Uh, they feel that it's very important when you're producing this music and presenting it to, to frame it with something. And I think this is probably part of a, a philosophy, a broader philosophy that people have today toward presenting traditional music. Namely, you don't just throw it out there and let the, the fiddler or the musician just sort of go out there and, and make it on his or her own. You need to have somebody who can, they, they call them presenters, somebody who can explain to the audience what the significance of this person is, what's important about him, what kind of tradition he's a part of, and kind of act as a go-between uh, so that the person who is not a professional understand, mm -hmm. a person who's maybe never faced an audience before, can go out and, uh, and do, do his thing and the audience can understand something of it. And I think the general feeling right now, this year in, in producing traditional music, is that if you're going to go to the trouble of putting on a record, that you do need to frame it and have that kind of presentation available via the form of good liner notes. Hmm. And I think some of the major companies are even coming over to that because I've noticed recently that, uh, that some of the bigger companies are starting to come around to the idea that good liner notes help. How many of these little record companies are out there? Any oh, idea? gosh. Tons uh, of them? Not as many as there were. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 70s, when we were working, I bet there were probably 35 or 40 dealing primarily with, with traditional music. Uh, now, there aren't that many. I believe last year, when we uh, totaled up the number of different companies represented by the, uh, the records that we recommended at the Library of Congress, we had come 30 different companies. But in some cases, they really couldn't be called record companies because what would happen in some cases is, is that an organization would, let's say, get a grant to produce a record and they would produce it and they would, really wouldn't have any intention of producing any more. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't really be called record companies. There were 30 different sources. But today, in terms of really active recording companies producing records on a regular basis, uh, there probably aren't more than 15 really doing it. But they have a marvelous diversity. A lot of people think that companies like this are only in the South. There's a company called Canyon Records out in Arizona that specializes in Apache Indian music <laughs> and traditional American Indian music. And he has a huge catalog. Uh, there's Swallow in Louisiana that deals with Cajun music. Uh, there's a company, I um, can't remember the name of it right now, but there's a company down in San Antonio that deals pretty much with with Nortino, Tex-Mex music. Is Arhuli the best known of this? Of Arhuli this is the best known and the biggest. Uh -huh. uh, they, they encompass a large number of different ethnic musics. They're uh, out of California, aren't they're they? They're out of California, yeah. Chris Strachwitz is a Swedish immigrant. He runs Arhuli. And he became interested primarily at first in blues. And he went, went down and did a lot of recording in Texas and, and did a lot of, of blues field recording. Then got interested in Cajun music. And now he's interested in Mexican music, Nortino music. Uh, and at the same time, maintaining his interest in other sorts of music. So he is probably the, the best well and uh, best known uh, recorder of, of material today. And he continually wins Grammys for uh, his Cajun records because Cajun music is very hot right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, he records people like Queen Ida and people of that sort. But uh, there are little companies all over the country. Now, a lot of these companies, and this is something we're just beginning to really figure out, a lot of these independent companies don't try to export their music out of their own neighborhood. 
Now, we do, like in the Folklore Society, we are anxious to send our records out to, uh, to other people, and we maintain a mail order service, and our Hooli does it, and others do it. But a lot of these recordings that are done within a, an ethnic community don't much come out of it. They're, they're not worried about it. Uh, there's, for example, a, a, a record company in Chicago that specializes in Ukrainian music for Ukrainian immigrants up in, the, in, in Illinois. And they're not the slightest bit worried if, if anybody else buys their records. Their audience is right there. If they can sell their 500 copies of the records in the Ukrainian uh, neighborhood in, in northern Chicago, then that's fine. That'll, that'll, that'll suit them. Uh, so if you include all of those companies, which are are really, they're not, they're not self-consciously folk music companies because the people producing them, for example, aren't folklorists. They're just musicians mm -hmm. who happen to like that kind of music. And they don't have liner notes. In a sense, they're sort of folk products themselves. Mm -hmm. But now, if you included that in addition to the companies that are sort of self-consciously producing folk music records, then the, the, the numbers really become impressive because you know, mo most of those recordings, we don't have any idea of how many there are. We don't have any lists of them. Uh, many of them aren't even filed in the copyright office. Hmm. And so there are, you know, you can go up into certain record companies in Pennsylvania, they'll have a catalog of 100 LPs of, fol of polka records. And you can't get them out of Pennsylvania. I mean, any place else you can't find them. But they'll sell 100 LPs, uh, different m types of LPs up there in one area. Now, is most of this stuff cut live? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's cut live on, on rudimentary... Uh uh, equipment? Some of it, well, yeah, rudimentary <clears throat> equipment in the sense that it's, uh, uh, most traditional musicians are used to going into the studio in one day and cutting an album. Mm -hmm. And they don't like, uh, in fact, I've talked to a number of traditional musicians who have gone into Nashville studios and they found themselves with these sound baffles and they found themselves in cubicles and they can't work that way. They have to see each other, they have to have eye contact, they have to be able to watch each other. And so as a result, uh, you have to cut them live. And you have to, uh, most, most albums are cut on quarter-inch tape. Mm -hmm. uh, an amazing number of these albums are probably just cut with, with one or two microphones, very little mixing involved. Uh, occasionally you'll find somebody who has maybe used a, you know, those little Yamaha mixers or something mm -hmm. like that to run a couple of extra microphones. But uh, it's cut-rate stuff. And it's, uh, it's sort of like, in a sense, it's, it's the same sort of thing that you get with all these... Uh, independently produced Vanity Press gospel records. Mm -hmm. The same thing. You go into the studio and you spend your, your six hours and you come up with an album. Hmm. So it's, you know, the technology there is, is it's really simply not, it's not as much that the people don't like it, it's just sort of not relevant to what they're doing. And with a lot of traditional music, you can afford to do that because uh, you, you're, you have acoustic music, you have maybe two or three instruments at most, and so there's no problem involved. Uh, mm -hmm. You can do a live album like that, and it'll sound pretty good. We had talked about uh, liner notes on albums, and I know you've done a number of those. We've talked about records. That brings us to discography. Okay. <laughs> so, because I want it brought to discography. First of all, tell me what discography is. Well, it's, it's basically the study, <clears throat> the study of recordings. That's the simplest way to explain it. Mm. Uh, it involves things like listing all of the recordings in a particular sequence. It involves things like who played on recordings. It involves the dates that recordings were made. Um, it's, it's basically the science. Uh, it, it's, it's sort of the, the musical counterpart to bibliography. And, right? and why is it important? Well, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, if the records are going to be taken seriously, we need to have just good basic information, just as you need to, uh, it's a starting point. Uh, with, uh, with bibliography, if you are going to start working on a particular writer or studying a particular writer, you first of all compile a list of that writer's works and when they were published, and that's just sort of your basic mm -hmm. set of facts. And the same thing seems to me to be true of uh, any professional singer that before you start seriously talking about a recording career, you need to compile a discography, a basic list of all that person's works. It's, it's sort of the collected works. In classical music, this has been done through, you know, through a series of catalog listings. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you hear somebody say, this is uh, so-and-so's Opus 14. Well, basically what that is is a list of, of that particular composer's uh, works and uh, Opus 14 is the 14th one on the list. Well, in popular music, what you need to have is a list of the artist's recordings, and discography provides that. And it's important simply as a very basic piece of information to start 
to start with. If you don't have the discography clear, you, there's no way to work out the artist's career. Because in most cases, the artists, what, what the art that we're talking about, the music, the only way to really study it is to, to look at records. And if you don't know the basic background of those records, there's no sense in, in really beginning. Let's, uh, let's talk about the old records to start okay. with. Uh, artists are dead or no longer recording and companies out of business. How hard is it to find these lists? How, is, how hard is it to get these records? Well, it's, um, it's, not, it's not the sort of thing that anybody can go into a library and do. And that, that's what's, what makes it kind of hard to explain to young people who are starting out in the business today. Um, the old discographers, and, and the first guy to use the term discography, incidentally, was a Frenchman uh, named Charles Doulanet who in 1937 produced a discography of jazz called the New Hot Discography. That's the first time the word discography was used. And he was another one of these Europeans who took our music more seriously than we did. But what he did was he worked primarily by collecting records, and he would collect all the records he could by a particular artist, and he would correspond to other people who had records, and he would notice the numbers on the records, and he would start to make sense out of them. Uh, most records have two numbers. They have what they call a release number or a catalog number, which is the number that you would order if you wanted to order the record. And then they would have a master number or a matrix number, and that would be the number that the, was actually assigned to the original recording at the time it was recorded. They won't at all be the same because if a person went into a studio, let's say in 1935, he would record four songs. And these four songs would be recorded, of course, in sequence. And just at the time they were recorded, they would be assigned a master catalog number by the record company. Then when they were released, they'd be assigned a release number. And they may not be released at the same time. Some of them may have been six or eight months apart. So you have to have these two numbers. And you can compile a surprising amount of this material just by looking at the records, because these are in the records. If you look closely at the labels mm -hmm. of the records, they're there. Uh, and then once you get beyond that stage, the next stage uh, involves really two steps. One is to try to, to flesh out the information by talking to the musicians themselves. And the second step is to try to find information in the recording company files. And for years and years, record collectors have been uh, going into various record company files. Most record companies are willing to cooperate with somebody who's you know, really interested in their history and uh, putting together this. But most record companies will have files of the master numbers and who recorded and whatnot. And uh, they have been pretty generous recently in letting people go in there. So while you can do a surprising amount of discography simply by going out and inspecting the records themselves, and maybe supplementing these with some interviews or some newspaper clippings. Eventually, to do a real discography, you're going to have to gain access to the company files. And as I said before, many companies don't really have too much trouble with this. CBS, for example, uh, in, in New York, has an entire archive that it maintains uh, in which they have gathered together all the, the records and information that they can about their recordings, and it's in one central location up there on 52nd Street. Do they have some good source books too? In RCA's well, they early do now. recordings. And yeah, as as this has developed uh, into uh, more and more of a of a widespread interest, uh, certain lists of master numbers have been published. Uh, there is the RCA Victor Master Book, which simply lists by master number all the recordings made uh, of any sort, and it's very useful to find out material. Um, in jazz and in blues. Uh, so those, those areas have been studied much more, much more intensively and for a much longer period of time than, than country music has. Uh, we actually have fairly complete discographies of jazz and blues that have been published now for some time, where you can simply open the book up to a certain page, find the, the particular artist you're interested in, and you will find a list of all of his recordings in chronological order. We don't have anything like that for, for mainstream pop music yet. We don't have anything like that at all for country music yet, uh, because the research is so far behind. You, you, you talked about mainstream pop music. I see the value historically of old recordings and whatnot. What value is there for discography of, of a new act or, or a current act? OK, um, a number of things. One is, is that um, it allows you to, to determine which musicians are playing on which particular cuts. Now, for example, here's an example. Uh, Ricky Skaggs, who is very popular now, made a lot of recordings as a sideman. And it's people who are really interested in tracing his career might be interested in finding out what some of these recordings are. In fact, it would be important probably to do that. Mm -hmm. Emmylou Harris uh, has sung 
harmony on a number of records that were not her own and has played backup on some other records. And again, a complete picture of her career would have to include that. You would have to have this modern discography to know that. Uh, later on, you'll, people will want to, uh, to know, for example, if a particular guitar player is playing on a particular cut. Uh, in jazz, for years and years, the main interest in discography was to, to pick out records in which a particular jazz man had a solo. Who's playing trumpet on this one? Mm -hmm. Or uh, an, a, a rather boring Paul Whiteman record might contain a marvelous 16-bar solo by Bix Beiderbecke, which instantly makes it interesting. And I, I can see the time when we'll be looking through uh, uh, tapes of, of rock bands looking for solos by people like Eric Clapton or Jimmy Page for the same reason. And, and it'd be interesting to confirm whether or not these people were in fact present on a particular session. So simply identifying what musicians are there, that's one important reason for discography. A second one is to sort out uh, the way things were influenced. It's important to know in some cases almost exactly uh, whether or not a particular recording of a tune preceded a second recording of a tune. Uh, or if you're trying to sort out influences, let's assume that you've got a, a recording like, uh, like Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, okay, we, we may assume that that has been an influential recording on somebody else's his work. It's important to know for sure when that recording was not only recorded, but also released because, and again, I want to emphasize in a lot of cases, the recording date's not, not necessarily the release date. So if you have a recording date, let's say, of, of uh, April the 15th, 1974 for Dark Side of the Moon, you have to look a little bit further because it may not have been made public until October of 1974. So if you're trying to argue that person X over here was influenced in his development by that album, then you're going to have to say, well, he couldn't have been influenced until October of 1974. And if he recorded an album in August of 1974, he couldn't have the influence. Mm -hmm. well, on, on the modern discographies, uh, isn't that pretty easy to get? D don't managers have all that sitting around their office? Well, no, managers don't. But in many cases, in the last 10 years, uh, people have been tending to put this stuff on record labels, mm -hmm. on the back covers, uh, because you know people want to give credit to all the mu musicians. And so in a lot of cases, uh, you can look on just the, the back liner notes and you'll usually find when it was recorded and you'll usually find who's on it. Mm -hmm. uh, managers may or may not have this stuff because it depends. If, if the act is producing itself, they would have it. If it's under contract to a label, the label will have it. Uh, and in some cases, uh, discography has gotten very complicated in the last 10 years because of the prevalence of overdub sessions. Mm -hmm. and it's hard to say, for example, nowadays, when an actual track was recorded, because it may have been recorded at four or five different times with different people coming in and doing overdubs. And it's hard to say, well, which one of these is really the, the central recording. It makes a nightmare for discographers. Yeah, it does. It creates a problem. We haven't even figured out exactly how to, how to deal with this in listing discographies yet, because uh, you know people might work on one track for a month. Mm -hmm. And so that's a problem, and we're going to have to deal with it. Um, the other thing about discography that's sometimes useful is that um, it, it lets us see, uh, in a sense, first the equivalent of first drafts or alternate drafts, because in some cases a discography will reveal perhaps unissued material from a session, which for, in some cases, for stupid reasons, was not issued. It might be very good material, mm -hmm. but the fact that it's existing is, is quite interesting. Uh, for, here's another example. Many people are aware of the fact that back in the 60s, what, 69, I believe, that Johnny Cash and Bob Dylan did a session together in Nashville. Well, one, one song was issued out of that session. And everybody said, well, isn't that kind of odd? They were supposed to do a whole album together, and they only did one session. Well, going into the discography files, we find out they did, in fact, record an entire session, and that some of the songs they did were very interesting, but in some cases, they were very untypical of either artist's work. So, but knowing that gives us quite a bit of insight into both Dylan and Cash, mm -hmm. trying to work out some of their stuff. Well, let me ask the question that people always ask about discography. Is there any money in it? Oh, no, no. Uh, I think even if you produced a discography that was of, of a fairly popular person, uh, you wouldn't have enough sales probably to justify your work. It's a real labor of love. I mean, it's, it's, it's a scientific document. Most people wouldn't really know how to read a discography. It's pretty boring. Mm -hmm. 
But if you're fascinated and interested with, with the person involved, then that's another story. Uh, but if you produced a discography today, for example, of Led Zeppelin, it might sell some, but it wouldn't sell nearly as much as a, as a book about Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. And most specialized discographies of stuff in the 20s and 30s are, you know, the, the sales are going to be minimal. You told me once a, a fascinating story about uh, MCA buying the chess catalog and not having a discographer around to tell them what they got uh, and, and getting taken, shall we say. You think you can tell that story in about, what, three, four minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not, but basically, you know, that was part of their difficulty was that they, they weren't sure what they had when they, when they bought it. And had they had a discographer around to take an inventory, uh, they would be able to find out that a lot of the stuff they bought was, was simply reissued tapes. Uh, in other words, that they, what they were doing was they were simply counting tapes, and they said, we've got, you know, 50,000 tapes we're going to sell you. A discographer could have told them that, some of those tapes would, would be the same song, perhaps, you know, retaped seven or eight times because, let's say, you have a, a Chuck Berry song like School Days. Okay, that's been reissued probably a dozen times or more on LPs, and each one of those tapes is a separate mm -hmm. tape. And so a discographer could have said, well, yeah, you've got, you've got 50,000 tapes, but they only represent X number of actual cuts. And the same thing is true, I think, of, of any major company today. I think, basically, a discographer on their staff is basically the person who's going to tell them what they have in their inventory and backlog. And that represents an incredible asset to their company. And in many cases, the people who are in charge today may not know about these assets. They may not know about the fact that they have, you know, a Willie Nelson album somewhere back there that nobody's ever heard of. And a discographer, somebody who could really be in charge and know what their back catalog would like, would be able to tell them this. Could be some million dollar mistakes out there being made. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, well, when I was working with a um, um, uh, project in Time Life, we found that Atlantic Records had, uh, had purchased at some point uh, two entire concerts by, by Willie Nelson and Waylon Jennings in Texas. And uh, they'd just sort of forgotten about them. They had never been issued. They were recorded during the height of the outlaw movement. Would have been great stuff mm -hmm. if they'd come out at the right time. And it's probably not the right time now, but, you know, they just, people, nobody, what had happened is the management at Atlantic had changed. The new people didn't know about this old stuff that they had done back in the catalog. And so as a result, uh, you know, they're, they're not, not, using, not being used. It, it'd be sort of like a publisher having a lot of uh, books in his back catalog and uh, not knowing what they were. Uh, because at certain times when somebody becomes popular or when some song becomes popular, uh, this stuff is going to be marketable again. And most young people joining a record company don't know about this. Right, they don't know about it, and in many cases, uh, you know, after three or four generations of turnovers, you, you know, develop a, sort of a tradition of, uh, of not knowing about it, mm -hmm. and pretty soon there's nobody there that knows where this stuff is. Okay. Charles, thanks uh, for part two here, <laughs> and I think we're going to, uh, to hang on and do a part three. This is Don Cusick with The Music Biz. Thank mm -hmm. you.